Alan Quinlan standing by, Rory O'Connor standing by. We're going to get stuck into the rugby in just a few minutes. But before all of that, a great story uh, from our series, The Leader's Questions with Stuart Lancaster, all of which is available up by uh, the full series, up available up on youtube.com forward slash off the ball. Performance coach Bill Bezik on the latest episode here speaking about Steve McLaren's first training session as a coach at Manchester United in early 1999. Well, a, a story I can share with you, and I, I, I think my friend Steve McLaren wouldn't mind. Um, I've heard him speak talk about this publicly but he came from Derby County to Manchester United in the space of three days um, his life was turned upside down he was the assistant manager of Manchester United so for his first day's training he decided that he would take a fun approach and get to know them and and and, and make it a little bit more social so he did team relays and team competitions to try and bed himself in and part way through this, Roy, who'd lost a, a competition and was made to do press-ups, walked off the field. He did say something, but I'm not going to repeat it, yeah. <laughs> um, he walked off the field and, and went home. And when I got back from Derby County that evening, Steve was on the phone to me and explained to me he was really devastated. His captain had walked off the field in the first day of training. And I said, you've got to ring Roy. And that was like asking somebody to catch a hand grenade. Uh, oh, I said, you've got to ring Roy. One principle of coaching is never let today's problem roll into tomorrow. It gets worse. Deal with it now. He rang Roy, and two hours later, he rang me and said, I've just had a master class in coaching. The only thing that Roy is interested in is hard work and challenge because that's what prepares him to go out in front of 75,000 people and television cameras on a Saturday. If he's not worked hard during the week, he doesn't feel ready for the performance on a Saturday. And I'd taken one of those training sessions that he needs so badly and abused it by doing things that weren't relevant to the game. That was Roy. He was very honest, very tough-minded, but actually very intelligent and perceptive about what top players needed. Bill Bezik there in conversation with uh, Stuart Lancaster during the week. As I said, you can check out that full piece up on our YouTube channel. It's nearly 9 o'clock. Rory's back with us, as you can see. And Alan Quinlan, good morning to you. Morning, Adrian. That um, piece there, I don't know how much of you heard, but uh, Bill Bezik, who's a performance coach, talking to Stuart Lancaster and Ger about um, Steve McLaren, who he would have worked with, and his first session as a coach at Manchester United. And to try and synopsize this as brief as I can, um, he goes in, holds a session, bit of a sort of personalised, bit of fun, get to know each other. Keen storms off after a while, out of the dressing, uh, uh, the training area, goes home. McLaren rings him later in the day, and Keen is like, "You ruined that session for me. I need it to." perform my best at the weekend and you just trampled all over it and uh, as you heard McLaren takes it all very personally and you know apologizes and all that stuff like there's another side to it that actually maybe for the entirety of the rest of the squad that fun thing of getting to know each other and something different to training totally worked it's a it's a vital part of uh, of um, high performance that you have a break have some fun sometime look I'm not sure what match it was that week and where Roy was at um, but that's we we know from his own he's him speaking about it himself that that's the way he wanted to be every mm -hmm. week and that's what made him tick that kind of desire and drive and motivation. Uh, in rugby, I'd often compare Paul to Roy Keane, just the detail and the energy right. and the, the the you know pushing each other in training and trying to get better all the time. But there was a great sense of fun in Paul off the field as well. Now, I don't know, I'm not saying that Roy Keane isn't a good crack off the field because I've met him personally a few times and he likes the rugby and he met us in, in, in New Zealand in 2008 on tour there and he was great crack. Right. We had a, went out for dinner with him, about five or six of us, and uh, he invited us out and um, he was in at Munster a few times and he was always great crack, great man for a few stories and stuff. So, But it's kind of like switching on to that psycho mode on the training pitch where I can relate to myself where I was so kind of fired up and in a different zone as a player and, and more relaxed off the field and laid back and calmer. Not completely like, but you know, a different, and the sports persons, people are different when they go cross that line and his line was when you go out onto the training pitch, not just the matches, but Roy Keane's was on the training pitch. So, 
But I've even been with Munster for that period of time where we were trying to grow stuff and there was all different characters coming in and out and we were trying to get better year after year and there was a real ambition and that was being driven by the players. At times we just downed tools and went for a few points or went away go-karting, paintball shooting, whatever the case may be. And, you know, so I think I can understand what McLaren was trying to do, yeah. but I can also understand that's what made Keane it, And I think, by all accounts, he was definitely a man for all of those things you've spoken about, but also the... I just don't know that he was acutely aware of... He was acutely aware of what he needed. I'm just not sure, as the club captain, he was acutely aware necessarily of what everybody else That's required. the key. I think, um, you know, I think if you give him his time back, he, uh, hindsight's a great thing. Mm -hmm. When experience is good and bad, you can change some things and maybe relax. So he probably put a lot of pressure on himself that this is what he needed. And <coughs> sometimes when you're in that zone, you think it's what everyone else needed. I saw so many different characters over the years in dressing rooms. Some guys who needed to bang their head off a wall to get up for a game. Other guys who would just listen to music. Guys who'd walk around the pitch to have their routine. Some guys are laughing and joking. And that's the part that used to annoy some, some of some players. Why is he laughing? Why is he chanting? Is he not focused? But that's, everybody's different in the way they deal with the the show, mm. the show is when the curtain opens, when you go out onto the field and the ball is kicked off in whatever sport, and in rugby or soccer or whatever, and uh, different people deal with that. So I think that's why sp uh, sports science nowadays is, is trying to edge is, and has gone to a different level about um, preparing people and, tr and one word you hear a lot is trying to be relaxed because that's where you can play the game in the dressing room or you can play it afterwards, it's out on the field. and. People handle that in different ways. So there's loads of different characters, and I would have seen so many different over the years. Like I say, some guys chatting, having a laugh, and you think, are they not up for the game? But they are actually up for it, but that's their Stay way of prepared. kind of staying calm. So I think Roy was, by his own admission, was this person who was just had that game face on all the time. I, I'm a Liverpool fan, but I, I loved watching Keane. And I, I just think of that United coming down the tunnel against Arsenal and the face looking across at Vieira. See you out there. That's, that's, you know, but that's what made him great as well, do you know what I mean? But um, maybe he didn't have the balance of, with yeah. that all the time, just for his own sanity, really, and his own calmness. But hey, he has had, he's had some career, to be fair. It was, he was incredible at United. We had uh, James Bond in earlier on telling us about his uh, stint spying in the Dublin footballers. Are there any good stories of either being spied on or spying on other teams? Well, I think we we, um, we have a good story. Uh, Pat Garrity, Lord to mercy on him, was... Um, Former Munster press officer. Yeah, and, and Rory probably, you would have probably got to know Pat and... and, and in Pat's latter years, and you were starting out, um, Pat was so paranoid about anyone watching training um, that he'd be going around the hill, the ball in UL, uh, looking out over the pitch, checking the ditch, see was there anyone in there. And uh, he was brilliant. And we used to get a kick out of it. And we would actually egg, egg, egg Pat on to go, oh, Pat, there's someone over there watching <laughs> training. And like, there'd be two students having a chat, like, and yeah. Pat would go over it's and quite har wide open though, harass him. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, like, when you're in a wide open space, but France was really good because we were, we were, I think we were in Stade Francais, um, I think it was 2004 or five, and um, there was someone up in the stand and Pat went up and had a right go off him. And uh, there was someone doing, it was someone doing maintenance in the, on, on, in the stadium or cleaning or something. And, um, you know, so it was brilliant. Uh, he was always kind of, but I, I'd say we were spied on loads of times in France because you've no idea, you're kind of doing a captain's run in the stadium and. It's so easy to do it. Or would you be going? You wouldn't be going full board though. At you the see, this is the thing. Um, <coughs> you can have someone look, but you don't. The tactics mm. and uh, and you know as a journalist, Rory, going to the captain's run on a Friday now is kind of pointless. Yeah. You don't see anything. You, it's good for player. If I'm doing commentary, player ident identifying players and the opposition and body language, and you get a sense of the mood in the camp. You chat to a few people, but as regards going seeing any sort of tactics on a Friday. You don't Doesn't see happen. him. And that's why I think, look, look, it's Joe Schmidt's kind of squads since he took over. It's, it's closed shop during the week. And, and I think it's right for the players. Mm. It's not right for the journalists uh, in a sense that they'd love to have more access and see more. But that's just the way of the world now. I think when you're doing those kind of tactics and it's in the intricate kind of tactical approach in all sports. Um, so... I'd say we were spied on loads of times, and in those earlier days, I'd say we confused more the spies than uh, than actually give them any information by 
probably training useless or making loads of mistakes or, or messing up some moves that we we're trying to run. But it's uh, it's an interesting one. But the rugby one, then um, the one in um, New Zealand when they went to Australia, when there was uh, right, yeah. sort of a device found in the. <clears throat> it's the only rugby really one I've heard from. Other than them actually letting out their lineout calls before the 2015 final. It was in Australia, the, the coach accidentally... They left him up on the board or something, Left him up on the board and the line calls were <coughs> revealed before, before the World Cup final. Yeah, that's, that's a danger because um, that is one area that um, if I was... You have to be very careful with the line because there's a certain kind of template that you'd use for each game tailored to the opposition. So if you're actually practicing the ones you're going to use and somebody's... Like if I saw a team doing a set of line now before a game and these are the ones they're going to use, I could easily say, look, defend this way, do it this way. They're they're throwing a lot to the tail, and they do this sort of movement, and you mm. could actually mess up some of those lineouts. And um, so, it's a lineouts are a dodgy one, all right, for sure. One of the other things that we wanted to touch on before we get into the rugby this weekend was um, Eddie Jones at his press conference yesterday, and uh, my read on it is there's some awful mad stuff coming out of it. Uh, left field thinking could be the key to England's World Cup success was one of the headlines that I read here. Um, I mean, it struck me there's maybe not much else working for them, but uh, Eddie Jones is talking about, on the one hand, Jack Knoll, who's a back coming in to play in the forwards as an open side flanker, I think he's uh, suggesting. And then on another hand, he's talking about starting nine forwards. So he's talking about one hand playing eight backs and another hand playing uh, nine forwards. Rugby World Cup here. Is he panicking, Quinny? Is this, is he, is he cracking I just here? I've just um, thrown out a bit of um, some information there to kind of confuse people or just uh, play, playing mind games, really. He's not going to play Jack Knoll as, as a number seven. Not a chance. It's hard to know when you're not in the room, but I got a transcript of that, that the yesterday. I just like I almost binned that whole section. I was like, that is just... Go there's no way he's playing Jack Knoll at seven and Joe Cocker to sing a in the second row, like, and he starts talking about the future of the game and all that sort of stuff. I think he was just filling, playing for time, you know. I mean, mm. it's just I'm not sure what like Ed, Eddie Jones walks into those rooms with a with a strategy of what he's going to say and what, what he's going to do, and he was very complimentary about Ireland yesterday, but didn't really want to get into Ireland and, and the game. He'll do that next week, or you know, he'll probably do that at the launch when there's a couple of Irish journalists there to get the mm. maximum impact. He was just playing for time. He does way more press than than or certainly Joe Schmidt does. So sometimes he's gold, other times mm. he goes down the, rabbit holes like The that. point Rory is saying about the game changing in the modern game, of course there's loads of backs that could play in, uh, as back rows, there's loads of back rows that could play as, as wingers, absolutely, there's, there's, there's a ton of them that could do that in the modern game, but you get into the technical side of it then, we saw what happened with um, Bergamasco. Uh, Bergamasco playing yes. there, but also um, the rugby league player who played for England. Oh, Burgess. Uh, Sam Burgess as well. He was being messed around six, twelve, six. 12. Playing the back row is a different thing. I think a back row can play if he's quick enough. Could play in the wing or mm. on the wing more than a back coming into. Dennis Leamy went out centre for a period in, in 2000 under Alan Gaffney with us because um, we had issues there and problems with injuries. And he played a couple of games as a centre. David Wallace played in the wing in the Celtic Cup final against the Scarlets. Mm. Uh, one stage, um, so and he ended up out there. In yeah, the, man, he ended up out there. Time. So I think back rows can probably do that, but the technical side of the breakdown is an issue. If you're Jack Knoll, would get blown away as a wing forward. If any of this was a good idea, but he's, he, he wouldn't be doing it in a rugby world cup year, right? Like he'd have he done it two years ago. If this Adrian, was, Adrian, he won't do any of this stuff. Right. He no, he's a squad there. The squad they've picked for the Ireland for the Six Nations a very strong squad. The Vuna Polar brothers back, Joe Launchbury back, Jack Clifford is back. He's a really good player who's had his injury problems. Um, Tom Curry is a really good seven. I think Underhill being injured is a, is 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 a loss for him. But I think they've loads of options. Um, yeah, it's a really good squad. Um, is it close to twenty seventeen levels here in terms of the potential of England in the Six Nations? Um, yeah, I think so. They're they're very strong. Um, there's a lot of talent there. The issues we have with the English players is their club form sometimes, and probably it is a legitimate argument the amount of games they play. The problem for Eddie Jones is when Ireland played England at Twickenham last year, the players were bashed to pieces by him. Every single, um, and that's what I was hearing at Twickenham, how right. hard they trained throughout that Six Nations. They were in full on contact every week. Um, the Tuesday or the Wednesday of the, I think it was the Wednesday of the Irish game, they did something like an hour and a half of full on contact. Um, and. Takes, you've got to experience that to understand how much you can take out of the body. It's like playing a midweek game. And
And sometimes the training sessions take more out of you because you actually have more direct impacts in those small drills where you're doing a rucking drill or one-on-one -on -one tackling. You can actually hurt yourself and physically kind of get lots of bumps and bruises in those training sessions. The modern game has to, and, and the International Rugby Player Survey will tell us that mm -hmm. players want less contact in training, they want to play less matches, particularly the English ones. Our player welfare programme is, is exceptional here and it's the envy of, of most of the world. Um, England have got to sort that out themselves because on paper they're a team that can beat anyone at any stage and make no bones about it, you could not underestimate that group coming to Dublin next week. Um, and if they get it right, they're a very, very dangerous proposition. But the key for England and Eddie Jones is, is learning from some of his mistakes. Um, that was a championship decider last year and, and he believed at that time that to have full-on contact and, and the players ripping shreds out of each other was the best preparation for Ireland, as opposed to Ireland probably did no contact, very little mm. contact that week and were fresh. And I think that's the kind of voice of the players nowadays is that they've got to be fresh. There's a certain amount of contact you have to do in a week's training. Some of that can be on pads and stuff. It's, it's different. I genuinely remember doing drills sometimes before in a three or four meter gap um, width and a player standing in the middle, four or five players, and you had to go through this drill and it was literally no space to go. It was just trying to run out over people or getting dumped back in your backside. and. Um, so contact and training is, is something that's in the modern game that needs to be tailored a little bit. You do need it at times. 